Jared Taylor, good morning. Good morning. It's been a while since we last met in Washington, D.C. at the NPI conference. Yes, yes. I'm delighted to be speaking to you again. Yes, and um, how, are things, uh, how are things doing in the United States? This is a very exciting year, 2016. Yes, uh, Donald Trump has made it particularly exciting. He has defied all of the critics and the pundits by winning the Republican nomination. And uh, there's a very good chance that he will once again defy them all by winning the election. We will see. This is a revolt against the elites, just as we have seen in the Brexit vote. Britain has decided to uh, slap their rulers in the face and, doing so and do something they've been told not to do, which is leave the European Union. I think it's entirely possible that we may be inspired by the British and slap our rulers in their faces as well and elect a new, a new diff and different president. Uh, who is um, who is voting uh, or who's rooting for Trump uh, these days compared to who is voting for a presumptive nominee for the Democrat Clinton? Well, it's very clear that uh, uh, all practically all of Trump's backers are white, and they tend to be white working class people, not so much educated people, although he has a certain number of them as well. But it is, is the people who have seen their lives changed by immigration, who have seen their lives changed by deindustrialization. It's the people who have not benefited from globalization. Also, uh, I think there's a good chance that he could get a large black vote because so far he has said nothing that really would offend black people. But when he talks about keeping out illegal immigrants, sending them back, these are the people who compete with blacks for lower paid jobs. So although he's frequently accused of racism, he has certainly never said anything that could really upset blacks. So I think there's a possibility that uh, at the general election, more blacks than people are anticipating will vote for him. Also, I think there's a good chance that he will get uh, a good number of uh, the people who are supporting Bernie Sanders. They are in a revolutionary mood, just as Trump voters are. And uh, Hillary Clinton is probably one of the best known, least loved of American politicians. Practically all Americans see her as right in the pocket of Wall Street interests, of globalization, of big money. She has this this insincerity about her when when she talks about caring about average working americans it's very very hard to believe that she gives a damn about average working americans what's she ever done for them you know but this is her saccharine approach to american problems so i think uh, uh donald trump is lucky in that he is facing this very undesirable candidate on the democratic side of course uh because he has defied so many pc taboos in his statements about Muslims and about immigration. There are many prominent Republicans who are ostentatiously going to vote for Hillary, or they're not going to vote at all. So this will be a difficulty for him. But at the same time, I think, uh, well, the, uh, the election is still many months away, but I think there's an excellent chance that he could actually win. How are the um, better looking 50% of the population, women? Would they, would they vote for a woman? Or in this case, um, they would still be... In Balanced. Well, at this point, uh, women are, uh, according to the polls, they are more likely to support uh, Hillary Clinton, especially single women. But we will see. We will see how things turn out. It, uh, the whole question of Hillary Clinton as appealing to women is in a way a double-edged sword because, as you know, he, uh, she was married to this uh, absolute disgraceful philanderer in the White House, and she stood by him. She never left him. She never denounced him. She stood by her man in this, uh, in an almost uh, slavish and uh, oh, uh, self-humiliating way, despite uh, just the obvious uh, misbehavior of her husband. And so, women who think that she's a strong feminist, uh, some of them are going to realize that uh, she's just in it for the ride. She wasn't going to denounce her husband because she wanted to tag along on his, on his political coattails. I suspect the two of them have probably not slept in the same bed for 10 years. In any case, uh, just how much of an appeal she really will be to women, that's an open question. Mm -hmm. Now, um, recent, in, in the last, let's say, 12 months, and, and, per, and maybe more, there has been, in, in these last years of the Obama administration, a very strong um, movement from um, 
Black Lives Matter, and the sell, suddenly the left, the, the, the liberals, as you call it in the United States, to, to spike up these racial tensions based on small phenomenon uh, yes. linked to some police and, and, and minorities. Um, and I was wondering how this social turmoil, which seems to be engineered and, and, or at least used by the media, is this something that is going to impact the, the election process in the, le in the next few months? I think unquestionably so. The Black Lives Matter movement has really shocked a number of white people. Here it is, 50, 60 years after the civil rights movement, and blacks are still rioting. They're rioting in Ferguson. They're rioting in Baltimore over events which among blacks are trumpeted as some kind of horrible militaristic oppression, outright murder of blacks. It's not that case at all. The case in Ferguson, for example, there, was ru there were rumors that were, of course, widely reported by, by the leftist press that Michael Brown, who was shot by a police officer, was shot utterly in cold blood, that he was on his knees, that he had his hands in the air, that he was surrendering, he was just shot down like a dog. Uh, this, was, this has been shown to be complete nonsense, but the facts do not matter. The fact that he was, he, was, he was high on marijuana, he had just robbed a convenience store, he attacked the officer, he tried to, to take the officer's gun away from him. I mean, if you attack a police officer, start punching him in the face, and try to take away his weapon, you're very likely to be shot, no matter what your race you are. And to turn a man like that into some kind of martyr and hero shows just how desperate blacks are to have martyrs and heroes these days. The same was true with the Trayvon, with the Trayvon Martin incident. I'm not sure how familiar your listeners are to that, with that. But this is a case in which a white man shot a black person in self-defense. He was attacking him, pounding him into the ground. What black people apparently still believe is that uh, this Hispanic, he was a, they call him a white Hispanic, when, uh, when Hispanics misbehave, then they're white, you see. If, yes. they're behave, if, if they're behaving nicely, then they're Hispanic. In any case, uh, he's an honorary white man if he, if, in the media's view if he kills a black man. In any case, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very clear that uh, he was acting in self-defense. He was on the ground. This man was on top of him, pounding him, broke his nose, uh, uh, and he fired one shot and killed him. But blacks still seem to think that this guy hunted down any random black guy and just shot him in cold blood. The facts don't matter. They simply don't matter. And when black people get this hopped up about obvious self-defense and accuse whites of gunning them down in cold blood, this is really shocking to ordinary white people. And the extent to which the media have promoted this view of brutal cops, this too has been a real motivating factor in, I think, raising the racial consciences of whites and encouraging them to vote in an insubordinate way in the elections that will be coming in November. Now, speaking of facts, I, um, I got myself a copy of uh, the a publication that you, you I think your, your organization, American Renaissance, uh, publi yes. publish it. Uh, yes. the, the Color of Crime, Race, Crime and Justice in America by um, Edwin Rubenstein. Yes. Um, now, I, I, I read through it. I had read the, the previous version. And um, the numbers that, uh, and the data that is quoted here is, is uh, it's outstandingly mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's not what you read in the media. And, and I was wondering if you could perhaps tell us a little bit about how, how you came to publish that and what it means um, for, for the United States, these kind of numbers? Well, the United States has had a, a terrible problem of race and crime for many, many years. And people will generally acknowledge that black people and Hispanics as well commit crimes at higher rates than whites. But they don't like to talk about it, and they like to make excuses for it. Generally, there are even many on the left, and the media are complicit in this view, who would suggest that if blacks are more likely to be arrested and in prison, it is only because racist police are going out there and arresting innocent black people and letting guilty white people get away. Mm. Uh, this is really 
quite absurd when you think about it. I mean, I can't imagine uh, a policeman discovering that uh, the suspect in a mugging was white and then saying, oh, well, okay, we won't bother to chase him, he's white. Uh, and the idea of going out and arresting arresting innocent black people, that just w is going to get you fired any day. You ha we have a justice system in the United States that is pretty careful about trying to avoid incarcerating people who are innocent. The idea that this is just a phenomenon of police racism is ridiculous. And we have proof of this because we have enormous surveys annually of the American citizenry. It's called the National Crime Victimization Survey. You take a huge sample population of about 100,000 Americans. That's an enormous mm. sample. You ask them what sort of crimes they've been victims of in the last year. And they ask them about the race of the perpetrator. And as it turns out, uh, when Americans are asked, who mugged you? They will say half the time, it was a black person. And as it turns out, about half of the muggers who are arrested are black. The same is true for virtually every other crime. The proportions of blacks and of people of other races that the police arrest perfectly match the proportions, the racial proportions of the people that Americans say were the perpetrators. So it's very clear to anyone who's looking into this seriously that police are arresting criminals and they arrest more blacks because blacks are more likely to be criminals. If blacks are 12%, 13% of the population and are committing 50% of certain crimes, including murder, for example, it works out to their being, uh, they're, they're committing these crimes at a per capita rate that can be 12 and even 15% higher than the white rate. All of these things are very, very well established factually, but no one wants to talk about this. This is practically a taboo in the United States. Criminologists know these things. The FBI knows these things. The Bureau of Justice Statistics, where the data in this color of crime come from, they know these things, but the media are almost always silent about this. The same is true, I would, I would, I would add, for interracial crime. According to this same National Crime Victimization Survey, there are about 600,000 crimes of violence every year that involve blacks and whites. Blacks are the perpetrators in 85% of these crimes. 85%. This means that on average, any given random black person is 25 or 27 times more likely to attack a white person than the other way around. This is information that you will never, ever find on NBC television or the New York Times, the Washington Post. This sort of thing is absolutely taboo. Is this worse than it was in the 1960s or, or in earlier times? Is it uh, getting worse from, from the data you're collecting? Or, um, or, or what? These data are generally pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, over the last 10 years, as it turns out, the black multiple of the white crime rate has declined somewhat. So that, for example, 10 years ago, if blacks were committing uh, robberies at 16 times the white rate, now it's down to about 12 times the white rate. There has been a general, a general uh, narrowing in the multiples, but the multiples are still extremely high. Uh, my suspicion is that this is a consequence of the, the, the large number of blacks who have been incarcerated. Crime has been declining in the United States yes. since about 1994. That was really the high point of crime in the United States, and it's been going down, but it's been a consequence, it seems to me quite clear, that uh, more and more criminals are being incarcerated. But uh, uh, no, the general trend of blacks committing crimes at much higher rates than whites, that is something that is consistent ever since the 19th century. Well, you, you, could, you go back to the 20s. Mm -hmm. The collection of statistics was not as sophisticated then, but you would find the same thing. There's a very famous study by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called uh, uh, The Negro in Philadelphia. He wrote this around the turn of the century. He was a black civil rights leader. He conceded that blacks were many times more likely to commit violent crimes, any kind of crimes, than whites. But he blamed this, of course, on poverty and racism and police racism. But he did concede that there were genuine behavioral differences as well. That's something that some leftists today would absolutely refuse. You could find, if you were to ask, uh, oh, I would guess Hillary Clinton, if you asked her, how much more likely are blacks and whites to commit violent crimes? She wouldn't know. 
And if you told her, well, you know, in fact, they are incarcerated about seven times the white rate. She said, oh, well, that's only because of poverty, police racism. She would instantly start making excuses for them. This is absolutely required in American society. Even so-called conservatives will make excuses of this kind. Now, I might point out that the differences, the uh, black or Hispanic multiples of violent crime are particularly striking in the big cities in America, in New York and Chicago. I don't know if you uh, looked carefully at those statistics, but uh, in New York City, the multiple for murder arrests by blacks as opposed to whites is 31 times. Yes. Blacks are 31 times more likely to be arrested. Hispanics are 12.4 times more likely. For robbery, blacks are 14.6 times more likely. And for the crime of shooting, this is when someone fires a weapon and the bullet strikes someone, whether it kills him or not. Blacks are 98.4 times more likely to be arrested than whites in New York City. I mean, Something like this is practically unheard of in sociological data to find population differences that are so extraordinary. And uh, uh, this is something, this is again the kind of information that is taken from official New York City Police Department sources, but that no one, no one wants to talk about. You could interpret these numbers somewhat differently, and uh, if you were to take the population of, the United, of, of New York City, and you were to uh, imagine a New York City that was populated exclusively by whites and that they committed crime at exactly the same rates as the current residents of New York City, you would find that such crimes as shootings and murder would go down by 90%. You could fire practically the entire police force. But uh, again, this is something that no one ever talks about. The, uh, I would go on to add, however, that in cities like Chicago or, or New York, the multiples, the Hispanic and black multiples of the white crime rates are particularly high because you have real contrast in the people who live there. The whites do tend to be more upper class, uh, wealthier people. But many of the blacks who live in Chicago, the south side of Chicago, or in Harlem in New York City, they really are. Those really are a kind of a ghetto. So there you have the sharpest contrast between black and white populations. And so instead of the multiples of robbery of, say, maybe uh, 15 to 1 uh, at a national level or murder at a, at a multiple of, uh, you know, 7 or 8 to 1 or 10 to 1 at a national level, you get these multiples of, as I said, 100 to 1 or 30 to 1. It's particularly sharp in these large cities. Another thing that is striking about the data from Chicago, for example, where they take, keep very careful records of uh, crime rates by sex, in other words, men as opposed to women. Yes, men are certainly more dangerous than women, but when you compare the crime rates of blacks as opposed to whites, blacks are considerably more dangerous than whites than men are more dangerous than women. Everyone understands that uh, a you know a black stranger or three black uh, I'm sorry three male strangers in your black in your backyard or coming down the street are potentially more of a risk than three female strangers. Everyone understands that. We do a kind of psychological uh, sexual profiling in our minds all the time. Well, on a statistical basis, you are even more justified if you're living in in Chicago or New York City in doing the same kind of racial profiling because blacks on the average are even more dangerous than white, sometimes considerably more dangerous than men are more dangerous than women. Again, this is something that is borne out absolutely irrefutably in the facts, but this is something that you will never read, you will never hear discussed in the media at large in the United States. Now, what um, obviously what we have been taught in through education and through the media is that this, this all of this must be caused by um, poverty, exclusion, yes. or even yes. racism. What's, yes. Um, what's your opinion or the facts that you have that explain that difference? Yes, uh, this is the classic explanation of uh, black criminality in the United States. I suppose we are to imagine 
uh, husbands and fathers, black husbands and fathers, who are so desperate to feed their hungry children that they go out and rob someone. Uh, this is uh, a, a, this is frankly laughable. The people who are committing crimes are young men who, for the most part, they may have children, but they don't pay any attention to them. They don't look after them. Crime is not committed because people are starving to death. It is committed for all sorts of reasons, quick wealth and an inability to defer gratification. And I would also point out that poverty is no explanation for rape, for example, or assault. Assault, uh, aggravated assault, rape, these are not crimes that have any kind of financial return at all. Mm -hmm. And why is it just because if you're poor, does that suddenly mean you're, you're going to be more likely to rape someone? It makes no sense to me. Furthermore, I think that you could make a more plausible argument that crime causes poverty rather than the other way around. If you have been in jail, in and out of jail since your adolescence, you're not going to have any saleable skills. You're not going, you're not likely to have a job that pays well. At the same time, if you live in a neighborhood full of violent people who commit crimes, businesses are not going to locate there. It's not going to be easy to find a job. So, in these areas with lots of violence, there's going to be poverty, but the poverty is more likely caused by the crime than the other way around. Another way to view crime is this. In the 1930s, after the huge Great Depression that set in in 1929, Americans became much poorer, suddenly much poorer. There was absolutely no effect on crime at all. And uh, uh, I think that if crime causes, if, if I'm sorry, if poverty causes crime, you should have seen a spike in the crime rates in America when so many Americans suddenly became poor. If you do a correlation, you can correlate st uh, crime in a particular area with poverty rates, with unemployment rates, with high school dropout rates, and there is a positive cor correlation. However, if you do a correlation of crime rates and the black population, the correlation is much steeper, much sharper. It is simply the presence of blacks that is the very best predictor of the amount of crime you're going to have in a, in a particular neighborhood. The, the presence of Hispanics results in crime rates that are sometimes two or three times the white rate, not nearly such a sharp differential as in the case of blacks. And interestingly enough, and uh, uh, I suppose this is never mentioned in the media as well because it would lead to questions about other comparisons, but Asians commit practically all crimes at maybe one half to sometimes even just one quarter the white rate. And this is curious because the Asian statistics include not just North Asians, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, but also Pacific Islanders, Samoans, uh, people from Guam, who do commit crimes at rather high rates. If you excluded those groups, the Pacific Islanders, and we're talking only about Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, you would have even lower rates of Asian crime. Now, again, this is something the media never mention either. I suppose it's because if they point this out, then the question then rises, well, okay, uh, what about other racial groups? So they don't talk about this. Another, uh, to return to this question of poverty, this, uh, there was a very important study done on the Chinatown in San Francisco. This was back in the 1950s. Chinatown was the part of San Francisco that was the poorest, that had the worst housing, the most unemployment, and yet the crime rates in Chinatown were very, very low. Poverty certainly did not cause the Chinese to be criminals. Why then should it suddenly cause blacks or Hispanics to be criminals? In any case, uh, there is one crime, however, in which Asians, Asians commit this crime at far higher rates than whites. <laughs> and uh, I will give you a little test yeah, and see if I you're, know. you think you know. I All think right, it must be around think? gambling. That's correct. Yeah, Very obviously. good. Yes. Uh, the Chinese, gambling. yes, the Chinese in particular love to gamble. And they don't see why you have to have a license in order to have a gambling den. But that is the one crime in which they commit uh, they, they commit uh, far higher rates than whites. Violent crime, property crime, white collar crime, all other kinds of crime, whether it's uh, sex crimes, it's they, they commit them at lower rates than whites. Now, um, if I may do the devil's advocate, 
yes. uh, on, on one point about uh, poverty and, uh, and, and, and culture. Let's put it that way. Uh, the, could there be that there is a cultural aspect in the sense that I was discussing with a very bright uh, black um, teacher, an old man who uh, used to be a teacher in the 60s and 70s. And he was telling me, I don't know if it's true, that's certainly his, his point of view, he was telling me that uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, the black uh, population in the United States was still seeing the, um, or was trying to emulate the white people, the white family, as an example to follow. That means being married, trying to be hardworking and honest. And, um, and suddenly in the 60s and 70s, when this idea of uh, um, new society and, 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 uh, and everything had to be, all the problems were due to racism, uh, suddenly the f black family broke down. And even today, I think, like 80% of, of, of black men, black, black Americans, are born out of a stable family from single mothers and things like that. Um, could yes, that be a factor? Yes. yes. Um, there has been an extraordinary change in American society. It's absolutely extraordinary. The illegitimacy rate, uh, people don't like to call it that these days, uh, birth out of wedlock, but it is uh, what was traditionally called the illegitimacy rate, has absolutely skyrocketed in the United States. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, oh, it was perhaps uh, the white illegitimacy rate was maybe 2 or 3%. The black illegitimacy rate was as high as maybe 7 or 8%. So it was a multiple of the white rate, but still mm -hmm. quite low. It began to rise in the 1950s and the 1960s, such that in 1965, when uh, uh, Moynihan, Patrick Moynihan wrote a famous study of uh, blacks, he uh, was shocked to discover that the black illegitimacy rate at that time was 25%. And he predicted the appearance of a, of a, a black underclass that was going to stay in poverty and illegitimacy and crime. 25%. Well, it's now, as you say, the illegitimacy rate is now about 80% among blacks. Now, it's gotten pretty high among whites, too. It's approaching 45%. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, in the case of whites, uh, sometimes these are couples, these are stable couples who are living together even without marriage. But this, too, is causing a serious breakdown, I think, in uh, the stability of families in the United States as well. But what does it mean when marriage has practically disappeared? from a certain group. There are parts of uh, the large cities in America, the black ghettos, in which no one even knows anyone who's married. Uh, I remember reading an article written by a black school teacher who uh, was talking about, uh, she was addressing some high school class and telling her students, this was a black teacher, telling her students that it's, uh, they need to get married, that that's the way to provide a stable home for, for their children. And the overwhelming reaction was, marriage? That's for white people. White people get married. Now, uh, there have been, of course, an enormous number of changes since the 1920s or since the 1960s in terms of uh, the acceptance of uh, non-marital sex, for example, the acceptance of divorce. Uh, it is absolutely remarkable to see the changes that have taken place in American society. But when standards of this kind break down, uh, it affects the most vulnerable groups. And in the United States, the most vulnerable groups, those that are most likely when standards or rules fall away to then completely deviate from norms are blacks. Now, before integration, at a time when blacks were legally required to stay out of white neighborhoods. Then you had a mix of middle class blacks and poorer blacks and even some upper class blacks. They lived in the same areas. And uh, you, there are many blacks who will argue that that was in many respects a healthier, a healthier society for blacks in general. They had role models in their own communities. They had they had preachers, they had uh, policemen, they had, uh, uh, they had uh, mayors, uh, all of, and people who were businessmen, whereas now 
all the blacks who are able to get out of the black neighborhoods do so because they prefer, as most normal people do, the stability and the peace and the pleasantness of living in white neighborhoods. But that has left the black underclass in this, this, this underclass in which marriage has disappeared, which people don't have jobs, uh, the idea of uh, actually having to put on, uh, put on a, a, a a proper a proper clothes and uh, pull up your pants and go work uh, is just despised. Uh, how uh, this, of course, was encouraged by the welfare policies of the Great Society. There was a time in the United States, and uh, I'm sure uh, Europe was the same way, because society so frowned on illegitimacy. People did get married. They didn't have children out of wedlock. And partly this was because the financial consequences were very bad. The government didn't give you handouts for this. You had to look to your family. Yes. And your family was very, very annoying. Well, some 16-year-old girl who had a child that she couldn't support. But now the government will support you. And uh, as some uh, conservatives have pointed out, any kind of behavior that you subsidize, you will get more of. In effect, the United States has subsidized illegitimacy. Yes. And that has contributed to a huge rise, particularly among blacks, but also among whites as well. So all of these things do contribute, I believe, to higher black crime rates, but I think there are underlying racial differences as well. Now, the, um, the obvious elephant in the room, especially if you, if you compare what you just said to the same data that you see in multicultural Brazil, or um, in South Africa, or now in, in Europe, which seem, start to have large black um, African uh, and uh, Caribbean minorities, uh, and seem to have the same kind of statistics. Uh, the yes. elephant of the room in, in the room the uh, in the room is that obviously there must be something linked to, on average, who are these uh, these people? What what makes them who they are? Yes, yes. For example, uh, a Metropolitan Police of London study uh, found in the, that in 2009, blacks were only 12% of London's population, but they committed 59% of the robbery and 67% of the gun crimes. Now, these are the kind of data exactly like the kind of data that you would find in the United States, despite the fact that uh, the blacks in Britain have a history that is completely different from American blacks. Britain did not have slavery, Britain did not have segregation, Jim Crow, lynching, none of those things. And yet you find blacks behaving from a crime point of view identically to blacks in the United States. You find the same phenomenon in Canada as well. It is very, very difficult to root these statistics out of the Canadians and the British. They try to keep them quiet, unlike the United States where this information is available. But as was the case in London, there was a, a special effort to get this, in, get this information. Similar statistics came out in Toronto as well, that blacks were 8.1% of the population, but accounted for 27% of all violent crimes. You find, you find the same phenomena everywhere. At the same time, you find uh, a kind of level of, I, I hate to use such a brutal word, but a level of savagery in Africa today that you simply don't find uh, in most of the rest of the world. When the Tutsi and the Hutu were killing each other, they, they macheted about a million of each other to death. I mean, this is just an extraordinary kind of bloodlust. Hard to imagine a million people of any other race hacking each other to death uh, with hand-to-hand -hand combat like this. And uh, this is, once again, uh, even in the United States, where we have relative freedom of speech, uh, something of a taboo subject. But uh, this kind of level of violence is not surprising given some of the physiological differences that we find between blacks and people of other races. Blacks have a lower average IQ and a higher level of testosterone in males. And in all societies, a combination of low IQ and high testosterone invariably tends towards criminality. 
Uh, I would point out that high intelligence, high intelligence and high testosterone is often associated with uh, uh, great success. Uh, politicians, uh, movie stars, uh, they tend to be high intelligence, high testosterone people. But if you have uh, lots of male hormones and not much brains, then you are likely to have a kind of smash and grab mentality that leads to crime. I would point out also that uh, this analysis, the physiological differences analysis, is one that fits perfectly with what we find with Asian crime rates. Asians have on average a higher uh, IQ than whites. If the white IQ is 100, the North Asian or East Asian IQ is probably about 104, 105. At the same time, Asians have uh, lower levels of testosterone than whites. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we see confirmed uh, by any person who is not completely blinded to reality. Uh, and as a consequence, in uh, Asian societies, men who are the ones who commit more crimes than women in all societies, Asian societies have far less crime. Uh, people will talk about the culture. People will talk about uh, social cohesion. But, of course, culture and social cohesion don't just drop out of the sky and lucky people get the good ones. These are, I believe, uh, grounded very firmly in the biological substrate of the society in which they arise. So, uh, it is true that environment, uh, poverty, illegitimacy, these things do not count for nothing in terms of group behavior. But, Ultimately, ultimately, all of these things derive pretty clearly from the biological substrate of a particular group or a society. Now, uh, it is that's perhaps uh, the most taboo thing that I have said uh, this entire conversation, is to point out that there are biological differences between the races. But if you refuse to accept those differences, nothing about the world makes sense. And once you do accept that there are differences in average IQ, as well as average differences in the ability to defer gratification, in other words, to work hard today for future benefits, and there are well-established, well-quantified differences along those lines as well. If you understand this, then you see that these differences play themselves out invariably in, in every in every society in which you find people of different races. Without this understanding of the modern world, the modern world simply makes no sense. In your, um, in your career, I've seen that uh, you've had the privilege to meet and discuss with uh, uh, people who have studied this matter, like uh, Mr. Rushton, uh, Mr. Lin. Uh, there was also um, a Finnish uh, gentleman whose name eludes me, Vatanen. Uh, Tatu, Tatu Van Hannen. Van Hannen. Uh, yes, and, uh, and, I've never actually met him, oh. but uh, yes, he has He has studied these questions very carefully. Uh, Richard Lynn is, is a good friend of mine. Uh, he is still alive. Um, he's still working very hard. Uh, he, in fact, he's just come out with uh, a new edition of his book on racial differences in intelligence. He is probably the foremost scholar living today who has uh, studied this question. I've also had the privilege of meeting and getting to know Arthur Jensen, Jensen. who was uh, Arthur Jensen. Yes. He was really one of the pioneers in this in this effort. Uh, uh, back in the 1960s, he first started studying this. Also, Philippe Rushton. Uh, unfortunately, Philippe Rushton died. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess must be four or five years yeah. ago now but he too he too was a very courageous scholar uh, those people paid a terrible price for choosing to study such unfashionable subjects uh, so they have been physically attacked their lectures have been have been shut down they have uh, had terrible problems with their university administrations and uh, uh, to me to me the real the real pity of all this is that young scholars coming up see the kinds of persecution that those people faced and it discourages them from doing doing similar kinds of research. So uh, I think that it is likely that at least for a while, research on the biological bases of differences in intelligence, differences in behavior, will slow down considerably in the United States, but it is being carried on with great eagerness in China. Yes. There is something called the Beijing Genomics Institute. The, the Chinese are not at all intimidated by shouts of racism or Nazism, and so they're not at all afraid to look into the extent to which genes govern intelligence. They are very serious about this. And the Chinese, once they discover 
which these genes are, if there is any way to encourage breeding in such a way as to increase the frequency of these genes, they will not hesitate to do so. And if they do, they will certainly leave us in the dust. Oh, yes. We are living in dysgenic uh, societies in Europe and, and in America now. Yes, yes. Uh, it used to be that intelligence was correlated with uh, uh, biological success, a, li a greater likelihood to survive and to have children and pass on your higher intelligence to your children. Uh, welfare has completely reversed that process. Uh, contraception, likewise, has reversed that process. Contraception is used by people who are more intelligent, who are more likely to think ahead. People who are less intelligent and more impulsive, they will... Uh, not take contraception, and because welfare has taken away the sting and the economic cost of bringing uh, people that you can't support into the world, we have encouraged the proliferation of the less competent, and we tax the more competent in order to subsidize this process. It's clearly not a trend that can go on forever. At some point, the system will come crashing down. You simply cannot force the Uh, the competent to subsidize a growing number of incompetent, the incompetents being people who will not be in a position either to pull their own weight or to help out others as well. So this is a trend that cannot go on forever. I must say that when I wrote my book about collapsing societies, um, that was one element that I did not see, but it's clearly one element that adds up to everything else to yes. accelerate the process. In Europe, yes. in Europe especially, uh, we have been um, fortunate in the last uh, thousand years to have a fairly homogeneous, at least um, on those population and race, races, uh, um, very homogeneous um, societies with a lot of difference yes. and with a lot of different cultures. In the last 40 years, we have seen an, an incredible acceleration of immigration from Uh, Asia, but especially Africa, and recently huge quant numbers from Middle East. And um, all these populations have widely uh, different IQ averages than the European populations. Um, unsurprisingly, we also seems to see, we seem to see the same crime waves um, with countries like Sweden who report 100% of 100%, not 90%, not 80%, 100% of violent rapes done by non-Europeans. And, and, and similar statistics across Europe. Um, do you see this as, a, once again, I'll be the devil, devil's advocate, a cultural phenomenon? Or once again, the same problems create the same, uh, are caused by the same effects? Um, what would you extrapolate? I'm much less familiar with Muslim societies than I am with uh, American blacks and uh, traditional African societies. And I think that there is perhaps something uh, to be said for the idea that people who have been reared in an Islamic society that denigrates the idea of women exposing even their faces, much less their legs, uh, that that can perhaps lead to certain kinds of crime. Uh, whether those people, if they live, uh, if they were converted to Christianity, if we can imagine such a thing, uh, whether the crime rates would decrease rapidly, uh, I don't know. Uh, I suspect that in the case of Muslims from the Middle East, there are genetic differences that uh, would play themselves out no matter what their religion. The... Uh, The average IQs of Middle Eastern countries are certainly not as low as African countries, but they are, as I recall, someplace midway between African and European countries. We're talking about IQs of perhaps uh, in, in the low 90s, uh, high 80s, and under those circumstances, you're definitely going to get more crime. Uh, to me, what has been as astonishing as anything else about this is the desire of the authorities in Europe to try to cover up the crimes of the immigrants. I'm sure you're aware of uh, the, uh, the assaults on German women at the, in Cologne on New Year's Eve. There were, there were, as I recall, about 400 German women who reported 
crimes, mm -hmm. being groped, uh, being assaulted, being robbed by these gangs of Middle Eastern men who would try to touch them and in some cases actually succeeded in raping them. 400 reported this. There must have been far more German women who did not bother to report this but who were groped and robbed. The astonishing thing here is that the Cologne Police Department didn't, tried to cover this up, tried to keep it a secret. Yeah. And then once this came out, once this came out, then not surprisingly, Germans and social media started saying rude things about Arabs. And as I recall, the interior minister of Germany, he said that these, these rude commentary about Arabs and Muslims was at least as awful as the crimes themselves. <laughs> well, well, no. I cannot imagine a person of another race ever saying such a thing, that it is perhaps worse to criticize people who have come into your country and violate your women than the acts of violation themselves. This is astonishing. This is astonishing. The same thing happened in a different way in the sex grooming scandals yes. in, in Great Britain. Yes, there were these Pakistanis, almost overwhelmingly, exclusively Pakistanis, who were luring these, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, young, young white, they were always young white girls who most of the time did not have stable home lives at all. Some of them were in orphanages, some of them had uh, drunks as, the, as their parents. In any case, they were luring them into a kind of sex slavery. Yeah. In, uh, in Rotherham, over the years, uh, uh, as I recall, more than a thousand white girls were treated this way, but the authorities and the police looked the other way. They didn't want to report this or prosecute these uh, uh, these Middle Easterners because they were afraid they would be accused of racism. They were they were afraid that because it was strictly Pakistani on white crime or Muslim on Christian crime, that this would look bad, and so they looked the other way. This is. I mean, Americans, uh, Americans, uh, those of us who are aware of the racial situation, we often like to think that the United States has been the pioneer in racial groveling and looking the other way. But I think we have actually been bested in this respect. When the Cologne authorities refused to report those assaults, and then it turns out, when the scandal comes out, that they had assaults in many, in, in many different German uh, cities at the same time, in Finland and Sweden as well. And the police, as if they were all all acting together, refuse to publicize this. Yes. What is this? What, what motivates this kind of thing? To me, there's some sort of suicidal, altruistic part of, uh, of uh, the European mentality that's being turned against us in a way that could ultimately be fatal to our people and our civilization. Absolutely. Do you see in the um, uh, rising uh, par political parties and movements that are labeled far right, I'm not sure if they are really far into the right, but uh, do you see that um, this may change something or this may awaken people? I certainly hope so. I think that the rise of, of yes, the so-called far right, uh, you find it in Austria, you find it uh, even in Sweden, you find it in France uh, with the alternative for Deutschland, you find it in Germany and Italy. All of these movements, I think, are a perfectly natural and healthy reaction to the sense that Europeans have that their countries are being invaded by people unlike themselves. It is, after all, only whites who have ever managed to convince themselves that by opening their societies voluntarily to people utterly unlike themselves who could eventually outnumber them, that this is somehow virtuous, that this is somehow good. If you, if you were to imagine, uh, oh, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of poor, crime-prone whites pouring across the border into Mexico, where they were buying up Mexican radio stations and broadcasting in English rather than Spanish and insisting on ballot papers in English, celebrating the 4th of July, Independence Day, rather than Mexican holidays. And some of them were muttering about becoming a majority and maybe taking over northern Mexico. Do you think the Mexicans could be tricked into thinking that this was cultural enrichment? Impossible. 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 But this is what we are supposed to think in the United States. This is wonderful. We will become better people. Whites will become better people as they become a powerless minority. This, this to me, in historical terms, this is an unprecedented form of psychosis. 
No people, no people who ever had the capacity to resist invasion has ever failed to do so. And what we see happening, what we see happening in Europe is uh, uh, you have you have started on this suicidal path a little bit later than we have. But the same mentality is is at work. The same mentality that requires that whites celebrate diversity, which is really nothing more than celebrating their own dwindling numbers and influence. Only crazy people would do that, but whites are supposed to do that. The same mentality is driving the police chief in Cologne and the interior minister to prefer to not to, to conceal the fact that these non-white, non-European newcomers are committing all sorts of horrible crimes. This, this is, uh, again, in any kind of historical terms, this sort of behavior is utterly unprecedented and unbelievable. I, I would add one more thing. Uh, people don't usually think of it in, this, in these terms, but uh, you, could, you could almost describe immigration policy as evolution policy. If a society uh, becomes 10% uh, Somali, when, uh, whereas it had been uh, 100% Swiss before, if it becomes 10% Somali, it is as if that society has evolved into something different. Yes. Its population is now a different population, and it has evolved in the direction of Somalia. You are left with a society in which there will be a certain amount of interbreeding, and the, pe the Swiss people, if that were to happen to them, will inevitably be, be changed. This is... Uh, but I, this is also a fruit of the absolute determination among liberal whites, leftist whites, to disbelieve the evidence of their senses and to pretend somehow that race is not a biological fact, but some kind of sociological optical illusion. Uh, this, to me, is uh, so obviously wrong and stupid that only very intelligent people could possibly persuade themselves that it's true. But it's one of the wonders of our time. It is indeed. Where can uh, our listeners um, find out more about um, the great publications that you publish and distribute at uh, American Renaissance? The best way to find out about what we do is at our website, uh, which is uh, uh, mren, A-M-R-E-N, dot com. Uh, we started American Renaissance uh, in 1990, so American Renaissance has been going on for a long time. It was originally a paper publication, but about four or five years ago, we switched entirely over to the Internet, so all of our mat material is now free and available on the net. Uh, we hold conferences from time to time, we publish monographs, and uh, we publish daily news items about uh, the dispossession of the West. We are just as passionate about what is happening to Europe as what is happening in the United States. I think of uh, uh, white people all around the world as a kind of, we are a worldwide brotherhood of Europeans, and our struggle is your struggle, and your struggle is our struggle. I think that uh, except for some of the countries in Eastern Europe, Hungary, uh, Czechos the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Poles, all whites everywhere, from uh, New Zealand to Canada, the United States to Great Britain to, to France, all have been infected by this notion that somehow it is virtuous to be dispossessed. And if we continue to believe this, you, we will certainly find people who will be happy to dispossess us, and we will lose our culture, we will lose our countries, and ultimately we will lose our, exi our existence as a distinct people. I, uh, I, had a, I had an interesting debate with a black college professor, oh, it was about two months ago, and we were debating the question of whether diversity is a strength for America or a weakness. And he said, it's a great strength. And one of its best features is that due to miscegenation, whites will eventually disappear. He said 200 years from now, there won't be any white people left. And that's a good thing. Now, here's a fellow who is rubbing his hands at the prospect of my people completely disappearing. Now, I am sometimes accused of being a hate monger. I don't know why, but I suppose because I talk about racial differences in intelligence, that makes you a hate monger. Well, here's a guy, here's a guy just licking his chops at the prospect of American white people going extinct. And uh, that's perfectly okay, apparently. Nobody's going to call him a hate monger. Imagine, imagine you'd say that on Jewish people or, Afri or blacks. 
Yes, you'd be yes, in jail. Yes. Oh no, you'd be finished. Uh, oh, yes. But but there you go. Well, so uh, no, yeah, you, you uh, I understand Switzerland uh, has uh, well, you have you have these uh, public ballots yes. uh, in which uh, the the people have a chance to express themselves. Uh, that, that's a very good thing. Yes. Uh, because the people on all of these questions are invariably more sensible than their rulers. Oh, yes. Uh, I think that's, of course, why we have had uh, this recent vote for Brexit. Uh, yes. Uh, although it, it, it's, in, it's unfortunate in a way, it's clear that the Brexit vote is a reflection of the, the fact that the British people are completely sick and tired of immigration and multiculturalism. And this is a vote primarily against those things rather than access to a European market. Of course. Now, yeah, so, but this was an opportunity they had to express themselves on that subject. Uh, the question of immigration and multiculturalism. The, uh, the irony is that even Britain within the European Union could have had a much more sensible policy on these questions than it did. Yes. The Hungarians, for example, they said, no, Angela Merkel, we're not going to accept a single one of these, of these Syrians. There's nothing Angela Merkel could do about it. If the British had had backbone, even while they were within the European Union, they could have preserved their nation much more successfully than they have. And I see no guarantee that just because they leave the Union, they will do the things that the vote for exit clearly means the British people want. That's true. In fact, mm -hmm. note that um, in majority, Scotland and Northern Ireland have voted to remain in, in Europe, and yes. uh, these are the two regions where they have the least immigration and the least foreigners. Yes. As for yes. Switzerland, yes. Um, I will tell you two things that could be interesting for your thoughts. First of all, that um, in the past, we, we are the country in Europe which has the most uh, immigration uh, mostly from Europe, but also from abroad, uh, than anyone, any other country. However, because we have been historically extremely selective in who we accepted and who we didn't, um, we only accepted the top maybe 1%, 2% of the, of, the, of the people who wanted to come. And therefore, we could select the high IQ uh, people from Greece, from Spain, from, from, from even from Somalia. And therefore... And therefore, we, we end up with this, I don't know, there was this famous case study in the 1980s where Switzerland accepted 20,000 people from Sri Lanka. Ooh. And almost every one of them were, was a doctor, a surgeon. Uh, so we, we took the elite. Hmm. And the prob hmm. the probably, the, the, I don't know what is the average IQ of Sri Lankan people. It's probably in the, in the middle 90s or, or, or it's probably close to 100. But the ones we took were probably close to 105 to 110 on average. And so it's mm. actually, it actually adds to the high IQ average of Switzerland. So we have this very unique case. It's, it, I, I presume it's, it's completely unique. There's no such other case in the world. However, that used to be the good old days because now obviously we are facing, uh, we have signed a few years back immigration um, protocols with the European Union which allow European people European nationality people to come into Europe, into Switzerland and work and we discovered that um, a lot of French who come in Switzerland, well they're not Europeans and a lot, of, uh, a lot of Germans who come to work in Switzerland they're not European and we cannot manage uh, the IQ uh, selection let's say as well as before because it's more the market forces so if people want low, low wage uh, street cleaners, well, surprise, surprise, they are Africans. And if you want yes. low-wage uh, factory workers, you may end up with Turkish or, or people from the Balkans. So we are also uh, getting this kind of immigration with the only caveat that because we have very low welfare, the people who are here, they usually are busy working and not doing anything else that is a problem. Um, also, of course, our prisons have a, a slightly bigger percentage of foreigners than Swiss people uh, committing crimes, actually a very large, higher percentage. Um, and it's mostly from the Balkan people because African immigration is still very low in Switzerland. And from the Balkans, you have a violent culture. And it could be also that there is some IQ thing, but I haven't checked that. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland has, is still a very rich and, and a unique country. And we have... Uh, last month, um, taken away our um, 
uh, formal request to enter the EU. So that is very, it's a very good sign. So there is no, no way that we're ever going to enter the EU, especially now that yes. it's dying and, and it's a good bet. <laughs> it's a good thing that it dies. Yes. Does, does Switzerland have any kind of reliable census statistics on the makeup of the country? Would it be possible to say how many Africans or how many Asians, how many non-whites uh, live in Switzerland? Is it, is it possible to get that kind of number? No, but we, we have nationality uh, statistics, so we can say there is uh, uh, 5,000 Somalis and, and therefore we know they are, they are African um, mm -hmm. because there's not many white Somalis. <laughs> uh, no. and, and, and it would be a little bit more complicated with South Africa, for example, or, or indeed with UK or France. Now yeah. it's becoming a mess. How do you know? So in fact, in France, you know, with, with our good friend Guillaume Fay, we know we only can know from the pharmaceutical industry, which runs tests and diagnostics on people from Africa with medicine tailored to them because they want to make money. And therefore, they know exactly what percentage of the population is non-European. And, and, and so we could, yes. we could find some data like that. I must say also right. that Switzerland has one big advantage, is that it takes something like 15 years to become Swiss. Mm -hmm. So it's not a two-year yes. or three-year process like in most other countries in Europe. So it, it's, very, it's very... However, we do have almost 20% of the population who lives in the territory who is not Swiss. Uh, so that's a, high, that's a high number. It's a very high number of yes. non-Swiss people living in Switzerland. You know, I, I, heard, I heard once, and uh, I never had this confirmed, that part of the process of becoming a Swiss citizen is that your community has some say in the matter. If you live oh, yes. in a particular village, uh, then uh, if the people in the village say, no, we don't want this guy to be Swiss, then yes. you don't become Swiss. It was never acted upon in the past, but because... Usually the process was so long and so difficult. You know, there, there, were, there are exams. When I became Swiss, I, used to, I had to go through exams and morality exam checks. And uh, the, I had to, to, to tell, explain the, the functioning system. So it wasn't just a, an oath. It, has, it went through a process of selection and also of, a, of examination, whether I could even understand the, the politics. And, the, and, the, um, and yes, in the, in, the, at the, in the final stage of the process, the, the commune you, you live in, the city you live in, um, the, 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 how do you say this, the, um, the mayor and the, and the advisors and the people from the commune uh, have to un un unanimously accept you. And uh, in wow. the re recent year, there's been more and more cases of people in the commune saying, no, this guy is a thug, we don't want him. And that <sighs> breaks the, the process completely. And, and, and it was n unheard of before because the process was selective enough and now, despite the selective process, people can still say no. And um, interestingly, in the, in, and this is something the left will never admit it, but the people who vote the most for the right-wing parties in Switzerland are people like me who, are, who used to be foreigners and became mm. Swiss. But because we understand where we come from, in my case, it's Italy. Okay, North Italy. But I, I, know, I have some friends who are originally from Algeria, high IQ engineers and so on, they don't want any more Algerians coming here because they know where they come from. They know the kind of people they left behind. They know that they don't want religious, crazy uh, Islamist types to come in Switzerland. So they vote for closing down the borders and limiting the, 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 um, the foreigners to what the market uh, requests and not what politicians' uh, pipe dreams want, which is a, a very unique case that Direct democracy enables. In representative democracies, you give a blank check to politicians, they have their own agendas, they have their own sponsors, and they have their lobbies telling them what to do. And yes. these lobbies are not usually our lobbies. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, in, in the case of the United States, the most obvious example of this is uh, the immigration reform that took place in 1965. Uh, until then, we had an immigration policy that yes. was explicitly designed to keep the country majority overwhelmingly European. And at the time, when the vote was taken, those who promoted this new law 
promised that there would be no no major change in the dem- demographic mix. This was just sort of window dressing, and it looked bad to have this racist immigration policy. Well, if at that time you had told Americans that uh, in less than 100 years, in about 80 years' time, white people were going to become a minority in their own country, it would have been impossible to get them to vote for something like that. I think even the people, even the legislators would never have voted for something like that. But even, I think, if it had been direct, direct, direct democracy, the American people at large would never have voted to change that policy. Yes. They wanted, they liked America as it was. But uh, now it's, uh, now anyone who says that, uh, well, what's wrong? What's wrong with maintaining the majority population of the United States? Then you're a white supremacist and a Nazi. <laughs> Question, one quick question yes. that what you just said led me to think of that. Now, in the early part of the 20th century, and, and even late part of 19th century, um, the immigration that was causing problems in the United States were Irish, Jewish, yes. and Italians. And yes. they were, I guess, in, impoverished people, most of them. Yeah. And, right. um, and there were, I remember reading in, when I was visiting Ellis Island, quite a lot of strong anti-immigration um, sentiment on these populations, which today are doing very, very well, of course. Um, were the crime rates of these population, Irish, Jewish, Italian, as high as the crime rates that Hispanics or black Americans have these days? Or is it it's comparable to white crime? The fact is, I don't know. Oh, okay. uh, it's, it's certainly the case that the Irish had a reputation for high criminality. Uh, the, the vehicles in which you take prisoners off to jail are, are still called, well, I guess it's, it's considered insulting now to call them paddy wagons. <laughs> a paddy, paddy is a nickname for uh, the Irish because that's a, Patrick is a common Irish name. They're called paddy wagons. I think uh, if those statistics exist, you would certainly find that the Irish were arrested at far higher rates for public drunkenness, violence. There's no question about that. But the pattern in the United States has been that so long as immigration is from Europe, after about three generations, European populations become indistinguishable from Mm -hmm. each other in terms of per capita income, the likelihood to go to university, and the likelihood to marry outside of one's ethnicity. In other words, Italians stop marrying marrying each other. The only difference there is Jews. Jews would end up having a higher endogamy rate uh, and uh, generally higher per capita income as well. They're the only outlier, but all other European it's, it's, groups, it's decreasing, they simply right? become indistinguishable. I, 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 I believe it has decreased to 50%. I think the endogamous rate of Jewish Americans yes. is less than 50%. I think most, yes. most of them now marry outside and that's Don't, right. Th- this, is a cause, this is a cause of great concern for mm-hmm. some uh, Jewish groups uh, <laughs> because, uh, well, they say they've been around for 3,000 years and if they keep marrying out, they will disappear. The, the ones who do not marry out, of course, are the Orthodox. Yes. And so conceivably, if this trend continues, then the, the, only, the only real Jews in America left will be Orthodox Jews. But uh, yes, as far as the European populations are concerned, uh, there has been there has been a very successful melting pot here in America, and uh, people will point to that. They will say, "Well, look, uh, at first the Irish were a problem, the Italians were a problem, and look, they're all fine now." So, by the same reasoning, Haitians and Guatemalans will become perfectly good Americans too. To that, I point out that there have always been two groups in the United States that predated the European ethnics who have not assimilated very well, and that's blacks and American Indians. The barrier to assimilation is, and this is the unfashionable point that people don't want to recognize, it's racial. Mm -hmm. There is this biological dividing line. And so you can be an Italian or a Swede or a Frenchman or an Englishman, and eventually your grandchildren are not going to be to to tell tell themselves apart from any other Americans. That's not the case and has never been the case with American Indians and and blacks. Mm -hmm. So this is... It is this lack of melting pot that is going to be characteristic of the post-1965 immigration in the United States.
in interesting. Well, thank you very much for your time. These are these are these were really covering um, uh, your answer. Really covered the question I had, and um, I wish you the best. And certainly, we'll be in touch because uh, I I follow what American Renaissance does every year, and it uh, you are I see that you're increasing in size and reach and quality of topics and scope. It's very, 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 very nice. And uh, I, uh, I wish you all the best to continue on that. We, we all need that. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to have this conversation. And I hope your new book is a huge bestseller. Thank you.